I'm continuing our autumn sermon series at Kenilworth Union called Imagine Scarcity, Abundant Reality. This sermon title is, sermon is called Generosity at the Edges and in the Corners. Our scripture lesson is the charming little short story, The Book of Ruth. I'll explain in a minute what's going on behind this little story, but it's about two widows, Naomi and her daughter-in-law, Ruth. Ruth is gleaning in the farm fields around uh, Jesus' birthplace town of Bethlehem. Ruth came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field that belonged to Boaz, who was one of Naomi's relatives. Then Boaz said to the head farmhand, To whom does this young woman belong? And the farmhand answered, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Boaz said to Ruth, I have ordered the young men not to bother you. They will take care of you. Naomi went to her mother-in-law, and Naomi said, My daughter, I need some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor. And when Boaz lies down, Observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. Ruth said, All that you tell me I will do. Now eventually Boaz took Ruth as his wife, and when they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son, and she called her son Obed. Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of David. Thanks be to God for God's holy word. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The book of Ruth is one of the most charming short stories ever told. Most of it takes place in Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus, about a thousand years before Jesus was born when Israel was nothing more than a loose tribal confederacy ruled by muscular chieftains called judges. Stories about two widows, Naomi, a 50-year-old Jew from Bethlehem, and Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, a 25-year-old Gentile from Moab, which shared an eastern border with Judea. Jews and Moabites hated each other. Now, it would take too long for me to explain why Naomi, a Jew from Bethlehem, had a Moabite daughter-in-law, but suffice it to say that they end up in Bethlehem, these two widows, 50 and 25 years old, respectively. Now, manlessness might be a good thing for many women in our day and age, but not in 1000 BC in Palestine. Naomi and Ruth have nothing. They are destitute. But... Ruth is fearless. She has guts. She has spirit. She has initiative. She's a go-getter. She's a mover and shaker. She marches over to the nearest Jewish farm to harvest the barley. Even though the barley is not hers, and even though she's not from around these parts, she knows that the Jewish law stipulates that every Jewish farmer must leave leftover crops in the fields for the poor. They never harvested the field to the edge of the field. They always left some feckin' stalks for the poor, the widow, and the orphan. At the corners, at the edges. In your vineyard, you pick most of the grapes, but not all. You always leave a few bursting clusters for the poor and the widow and the orphan. When you harvest your olives, you shake the trees just once. And any olives that don't fall off the tree that first time, you leave for the poor, the orphan, and the widow. It was the law. Ruth engages in the ancient practice of gleaning. She picks up the leftovers. Now, happily, this ancient tradition of gleaning still goes on today. 96 billion pounds of crops, about 7% of the entire U.S. agricultural yield, go unharvested every year and get plowed under the soil. The farms of central Florida supply the tourist industry in and around Orlando, Disney World, and convention centers 
and hotels. This spring, as you might guess, demand just dried up. There were no tourists in Orlando this spring or summer. No one wanted all that food. One farmer grew cucumbers, which every year he sold to the Vlasic Pickle Company, who would then, in turn, sell them to the hotels and Disney World. But this spring, of course, the demand just dried up. So this farmer called the Society of St. Andrew, which was founded by the United Methodist Church, and which sends volunteers into the fields to harvest these unwanted crops, and then they send it over to the food banks. Now, this farmer was disconsolate. He said, it's the best crop I've ever had, but it doesn't pay to harvest. You better come out here. It's all yours, acre upon acre upon acre, all for the poor. So back to 1000 BC, a Jew named Boaz owns owns this farm where Ruth is harvesting the leftovers alongside Boaz's farmhands without permission. She doesn't need permission. It's the law. And when Boaz visits his field and spies this fetching shiksa out there that he's never seen before, he asks his farmhands, who is this? And they tell her she's a Gentile from Moab. And Boaz says, be sloppy. Leave some for her. Leave some for this poor widow. Leave a whole row untouched. And when Ruth comes home to Naomi with bushels of barley and tells Naomi about this friendly farmer, you will not believe what happens next. You will not believe it. Naomi, this pious, observant, God-fearing Jew, tells her Gentile daughter-in-law, this is what we're going to do. Break out your smokiest eyeshadow and your reddest lipstick and your slinkiest skirt and go back to Boaz. It's late at night. Ruth goes over to Boaz, and, well, I can't even tell you what happens next. It's too R-rated, but you might be able to guess. It works. Eventually, Boaz takes Ruth as his wife. Eventually, they have children. You know, Ruth and Naomi get this charming little farmhouse with a mother-in-law suite a 401k, blue cross, blue shield, and eventually children and grandchildren. Boaz and Ruth come together. The Lord sees to it that Ruth has a son. They call this son Obed. Eventually, Obed has a son. He calls his son Jesse. Eventually, Jesse has a son, and they call his name. You know what that name is. Ruth's story concludes with the mother of all happy endings. The last word in the book of Ruth is David. Can you believe it? Jesus the Christ as a Gentile, Moabite, great, 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 great grandmother. Eventually, after 42 generations, Boaz's generosity at the edges and in the corners, leads to the Messiah. Generosity at the edges and in in the corners. Last week, Joe preached a great sermon about big generosity, generosity at the center of our lives. She talked about the very mission of the American corporation. She wondered whether the ancient, sprawling, comprehensive system of capitalism is working for all Americans. That sermon is much more important than this sermon. This sermon is about small generosities, tiny generosities, daily generosities, negligible, almost invisible generosities. Don't scrape your field bare. Leave something in the corner for the poor, the widow, and the orphan. The Houston Rockets entered the NBA so-called bubble at the Grand Floridian Hotel near Orlando on July 22 when the Rockets were eliminated from the playoffs. Last week, Russell Westbrook packed his gear to return home. He left a tip for the housekeepers, $8,000. Now it's true that's pocket change for Russell Westbrook. He earns $38.5 million a year, which is second behind Steph Curry. 
$8,000 for Russell Westbrook is like $10 for me. But Russell Westbrook is legendary for his charity and his generosity. He doesn't scrape his field bare. He leaves a little for the poor and the maids and the janitors. I told you before about my friend George. He was one of the most generous people I've ever met. He was in his late 70s when I met him about 20 years ago. George was from the south side of Chicago. He earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago and a master's degree from the University of Michigan, and it don't get no better than that. George lived with his mother across the street from my church in Greenwich. He was a pious, observant, lifelong Catholic, never missed a mass, sometimes went to multiple masses in a week, but when his mother died, he wandered across the street to the Presbyterian Church where we were sponsoring a grief group, and he met and befriended me. George was an only child. He'd never married. He had no children, no living relatives, so he adopted Kathy and Michael and Taylor and me as his surrogate family. After what George called the Presbyterian Mass on Sunday mornings, he would sometimes take me out to lunch at this ancient, beat-up Italian restaurant about a block from the church. This restaurant must have been about 70 years old, passed down from father to son over the generations and never remodeled once. The tables and chairs looked like they'd come from a church basement, and the carpet was so worn and stained that it looked like a Jackson Pollock painting on the floor. Noon on a Sunday was a slow time for this Italian restaurant. There were maybe one or two tables in the restaurant when George and I arrived, and the maitre d' showed us to our table, and then the maitre d' hustles over to the telephone to call Tony, George's favorite waiter, who's not supposed to be working this day. Tony lives in White Plains, which is at least 30 minutes from Greenwich. And Tony hustles into his car, drives straight over to the restaurant to wait on George. You can probably guess why. When the check for this lunch arrived for the two of us, George and me, might have been, let's say, $75, and George adds a $150 tip. That's why Tony came all the way from White Plains to wait on George and me. He did this every single time. He was famous among local restaurants. He got the best service I've ever seen. At least a three-figure tip every time he ate out. And I tell you that little story because that $150 gratuity is emblematic of George's long, large, lavish, loving life. Generosity at the edges and in the corners isn't always about money. In fact, it usually isn't. It's writing that spontaneous note to your long-lost friend. It's making that unnecessary phone call to someone who's alone during this pandemic and might be fragile, emotionally vulnerable. Your junior colleague works hours of overtime polishing your presentation to a professional and persuasive sheen. And so you give her a gift card or something like that. It's not the gift card that matters. It's your words. It's your acknowledgement. It's your gratitude. She'll never forget that. When my son was 17, he and I were playing golf at the little golf club in Old Greenwich we belonged to. It was just the two of us. We were playing behind this foursome. And at the third tee, this foursome noticed that they, we'd been waiting for them for a couple of holes, and so they met us at the third tee and told us to play through, which I always hate because my golf game does not need an audience. All of these guys were fit athletes in their 40s who looked like they had uh, single-digit handicaps, all of them. So they waited in their carts while Michael teed off, and Michael hits this beautiful drive about 270 yards down the broad green throat of that fairway. And one of the guys in that foursome says, Wow, I don't even drive that far on vacation. Just a witty little tossed-off compliment to a 17-year-old kid, but you should have seen my son beam with pride 
Every day, all the time, there are so many opportunities for us to practice a generosity at the edges and in the corners, support, kindness, encouragement. The farmer tells his harvesters, don't scrape the field bare. Be a little careless. Leave whole rows of feckin' stalks for this poor widow. Who knows, maybe a thousand years later, a baby boy will be born in your own tiny, humble hometown. And this baby will grow up to save the entire world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen.